school board and we welcome you to our fall and be Le shepherd lecture series now in the footsteps of Marco Polo a 21st century journey if you look at a map showing Marco Polo's remarkable uh, travels in the 13th century you might well think he worked for the UN and was visiting today's geopolitical hotspots which is pretty much what the lecture committee thought when we put together this series we wanted our opening lecture to be someone who could put the whole thing in historical perspective, and we probably couldn't have done better than tonight's speaker, Professor Stephen Kotkin. Professor Kotkin graduated from the University of Rochester, received his MA and PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He came to Princeton's history department in 1989 and is currently Rosengarten Professor of Modern and Contemporary History, Director of the Program in Russian and Eurasian Studies, and professor, professor of International Affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School. His current work focuses on uncivil society, the conundrums of authoritarian politics, and empire. His many publications reflect his particular interest in Russia and Eurasia. To get us started on our journey tonight, Professor Kotkin has chosen Genghis Khan and the Story of Asia. Thank you for, to the adult school for the honor of the invitation. I believe the microphone is on. It's blinking green. I started teaching here at Princeton University 20 years ago. This is my 21st year. I began in September 1989. And the Berlin Wall fell two months into my first course. The notes weren't even yellow yet. We have no idea what the future is going to be. But what history shows is that the present will not continue. In the old days for entertainment, they had a coliseum. It was not that different from this. There was somebody down here. There were some hungry lions on the other side of a gate. And the gate would come up, and these super hungry lions that hadn't been fed in a while would rush out. And there'd be some poor slob in the middle who would provide the dinner and thereby the entertainment. However, the lion came out one evening, ran up. The poor slob said something, whispered something into the lion's ear, and the hungry lion walked back out. The emperor in the imperial box was furious, said, send my hungriest lion out. Hungriest lion came out, went right up to take the dinner. The poor slob whispered something into the hungry lion's ear, and once again, the hungry lion pranced right out. Now the emperor was livid, summoned. Poor slob to the imperial box and said, before I kill you with my own sword, tell me, what is it that you said to my best lions? Nothing. I just told them that after dinner, there was going to be a speech. <laughs> it's a tough slot. Eight o'clock after dinner, you're with me now. <laughs> but in five minutes, where will you be? <laughs> a 
Tough slot. I teach the World History course here at Princeton. I'm one of the two principal lecturers in the World History course, along with Jeremy Edelman. I'm going to give you a kind of taste of that World History course. I also wrote a book on the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of communism, which just came out this week called Uncivil Society, and I'll be speaking at the Woodrow Wilson School on November 10th at 4.30 on that subject, the fall of the wall and the collapse of communism. It was a Ponzi scheme, communism. <laughs> it was. What can we do in an evening to kick off a lecture series like this? There are roughly Four major centers, spheres, cultural spheres on the Eurasian landmass, ancient China, the mosaic of India, both of which are monsoon civilizations based upon rice. Rice yields are enormously greater than wheat and can support very large populations. There's also what we call the Roman Empire, which becomes Europe, on the other end of Eurasia. And then smack in the middle, there's what is often called the Islamic world. But in fact, there is a pre-Islamic story here, which is mostly about Persian or Iranian civilization. The Persephone world, the Persian-speaking world, was enormous. And most of the place names between Europe and China are, in fact, derived from Persian language. The ancient and medieval Persians are not usually put in the same story with ancient China or the Roman Empire, but they ought to be. In addition, geographically speaking, if you look at a map of Eurasia, there's a mountain range. It goes from the Pyrenees, through the Alps, through the Balkans, through the Caucasus, all the way to the Himalayas and out to the Pacific Ocean. It's like the spine of the Eurasian landmass. The two great monsoon civilizations, China and India, are obviously south of that spine. The Roman Empire slash European story is mostly to the north of that spine, although it had started out south of it on the Italian peninsula and the Mediterranean world. The Persians, the Iranian story, is right smack on the top of the mountain range, straddling both north and south. If you go a little bit farther ahead in time, just so that you understand this geographical picture well, the Russian Empire will fill much of the space north of the mountain range north of Afghanistan, north of Iran. It will make it into the Caucasus, which takes the Russians a century to conquer. They conquer the lowlands in a few years, and it takes them a century to conquer upwards into the Caucasus mountains. The Russians are north of the Eurasian spine, and the British Empire is primarily to the south of the Eurasian spine. And then as they say, Iran, Persian civilization is right on top of that, as is Afghanistan, also on top of the mountains. The mountains are even taller in Afghanistan than in Persia. So this is the geographical space with the civilizational centers that the series, I believe, is going to focus on. We're going to begin in the middle of the story with the Mongols. The Mongols are not the start. They are the middle. But they're a very important middle. Because what the Mongols do is they connect both ends of Eurasia, the European end and the Chinese end, for the first time in about 800 years. Now, think about it this way. Somewhere around the year 1200, 1206, not sure exactly, a bunch of tribes north of what 
is called the Chinese Wall, banded together. At a meeting, chiefs of various tribes present acclaimed one family, one clan, ruler of this now brought together group. Temujin, we know him as Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan the leader of not very populous tribes in a not very auspicious climate, without any great cities, without masses of capital, nonetheless becomes the ruler of much of the known world. In fact, within the span of a single human lifetime, a single human lifetime, that is to say, fewer years than some people in this room have experienced in their own lifetime, the Mongol Empire of Chinggis Khan and his sons stretches 6,000 miles wide. Chinggis breaks through out of the northern steppe and desert areas in the direction of Afghanistan and Persia. His sons take China, what will become Russia, and camp out on both the Adriatic and the Pacific. A single human lifetime, 6,000 miles. Why? Why did this happen? We're not sure, but there are some theories. The first theory is that the civilizations cut off trade. The Mongols and who were nomadic, that is to say they roamed with their livestock, depending on the weather and the season. The Mongols who were nomadic needed goods that were produced in agricultural civilizations and cities. Stirrups, saddles, metals, tools, utensils. There was a very brisk trade between the steppe nomadic livestock herders and the sedentary peoples, agricultural and artisanal. Around 1200, what was then China, began to decrease trade with those peoples to the north beyond the wall. It's possible that this created pressure on the Mongols to move into an offensive mode and to seek conquest to compensate for that trade that was decreased. Mongol conquest took place entirely along the trade routes. Because as they used to say when I was growing up and robbing banks, uh, that's where the money is. <laughs> along the trade routes. A second reason, climatologists have studied the climate in the period 1100 to 1300 and it seems to have gotten colder. It was the anti-gore. <laughs> Any of you win a Nobel this year? I didn't either. <laughs> it got colder, and the surmise is that possibly there was less vegetation in the steppes, less to eat for the Mongol horses, and therefore they moved out looking for food. It could also be that they were just looking for glory. In the no guts, no glory slogan, conquest may have been something that appealed to them at the level of ideas. We don't know for sure. Maybe they were compelled by decreased trade or by lower temperatures and less vegetation. Maybe they were enticed by the idea of empire which they had assimilated through contacts with the sedentary peoples. We don't know. The big mystery, however, is not why they moved out and conquered almost the entire known world, 6,000 miles in a single lifetime. The big question is how? How could they have possibly done that? The population of Mongols in the year 1300 has been estimated at 700,000, 700,000 in the year 1300. The population of China 
which Mongols ruled, was 100 million. We're not sure exactly. That's a good guess. 100 million in China and 700,000 total Mongols for the whole 6,000 miles. How was it possible? This is actually the mystery. The answer is, empire is not what we think it is. Sure, there was conquest. Yes, Mongol armies were mean and nasty. They burned down your cities. They stole all of your women. They took everything in sight. If you resisted, they killed you and 10 more people for every one who resisted. Sure, they were mean and nasty. That's what conquest is about. When you use force, as Machiavelli used to say, you got to use it all the way. All the way, not halfway. You use force all the way, and the next person thinks twice about resisting you. And the more the Mongols burned down, the more the next cities over said, maybe we should cut a deal with them. Maybe we should negotiate ourselves into the Mongol Empire. Maybe we shouldn't resist. So yes, the Mongols were nasty in the battlefield, which was one of their strengths. It was a lesson to those who might resist. They had incredible battlefield tactics. A Mongol army carried everything very easily. They ate the grass. The horses ate the grass. The horses produced milk. And the Mongols made everything they needed to eat from the milk. The dung from their animals was their fuel. The Mongols could supply an entire army for years at a time in the faraway steppe because that was just that was their way of life. That's how they lived. To fight against them, you had to wheel carts of grain, udon noodles, flavor packets. <laughs> Not to mention all those weapons, cannons, whatever it might be. When the last Mongol army was defeated in the 1750s by the Qing of China, by the Qing rulers of China, they traveled longer and farther than Napoleon did to get into Russia. And in their case, they actually won. They committed a genocide against the Mongols in the 1750s and wiped them out. But the Mongols didn't have to worry about supply because their way of life and their army were the same thing. Secondly, their battlefield tactics, as I said, were very clever. Very clever. If an army came up towards them, the Mongols wouldn't fight it. They would just ride the horses out and disappear. They would vanish. And that army was left to feed itself with whatever it had carried for as long as the Mongols had vanished or to chase the Mongols through the steppe. The Mongols could just go away for a year or two years. And then they could come up from behind that army. Or they could go away for a week and come up behind that army. So yes, conquest, military conquest, and military tactics were clearly a part of it. But military alone will never build you an empire not on that scale. No. Sex. It was sex. You think I'm only saying that to be popular. <laughs> I haven't been popular since before high school. <laughs> so there is a craving. I'll grant you that. But I'm actually serious. Sex. What the Mongols did was that they gave away their daughters. They intermarried their daughters to the tribal leaders of everyone they conquered or wanted an alliance with. These daughters became the second, third, fourth, fifth, hundredth wife or concubine of that tribal leader who produced children who had a kin relation with the Mongols and by the kinship ties, 
were duty bound to be loyal to the Mongols. Moreover, the Mongols took the daughters of the tribal chiefs they wanted to conquer or ally with as gifts themselves and produced offspring who then were duty bound, as it were, through the kinship ties to be loyal to Mongol rule. So through intermarriage, through the exchange of daughters, that's how the empire was sealed. That was the strength of the empire. At the very top, there was something called the Chinggisid principle, or the golden lineage, the golden bone. This was that to be a Khan, to be a ruler, you had to be descended from Chinggis directly on the male line. You had to be a direct descendant of Chinggis on the male line. Sometimes Stalin was called the father of all peoples. This is not true. Genghis Khan was the father of all peoples. He took hundreds of wives and had thousands of children because that was how empire was created. 17 million people on the earth today by chromosome analysis are direct descendants of Genghis Khan. 17 million people today. That's known. Who knows? You guys might want to go out and get tested. Right. <laughs> Those of you who are males could be a Khan if you're not already. I suspect some of you are, given family patterns in America. So you had patrimony was king, but daughters were the glue of the empire. And the more people capitulated without a fight, because they saw what happened to those who fought, the more people capitulated without a fight, the more daughters they got. And therefore, the more intermarried and tied to the Mongol contraption they were. The Chinggisid principle meant they had to be loyal to the Khan. And the lineage intermarriage, kinship ties meant loyalty to those intermediate layers below the Khan. In hundreds and hundreds of years after Mongol rule, many people who tried to be Khan without direct descendants from Chinggis on the male line were seen as illegitimate. They claimed the Khanship, but people wouldn't recognize them as Khans. Tamerlane, Timur the Lame, you will know him as a Turkic speaking ruler in Inner Asia. He's the one who's buried in Samarkand. If you've been on the Silk Road in Central Asia, Samarkand, Bukhara, Kiva, Tashkent. The constructions of Tamerlane have survived. They were restored under Soviet rule in the 1970s. He claimed to be a Khan, but he was not descended from Chinggis. And he was therefore seen as illegitimate. So. They were able, in some ways, to erect this empire through conquest, obviously, but also through sex in a marriage. The Habsburgs did it the same way. In fact, most empires did it like that. The royal houses in Europe exchanged relatives to bind them. It didn't help. They still had World War I anyway, even though they were all relatives. The Kaiser. Nicholas II, the Tsar, they were all relatives of Queen Victoria. <coughs> Same thing in the Inner Asia steps. Now, there were a couple of other twists to the Mongol Empire that you should know about. The destruction, the destructiveness, which was part of their power and which was a tool in forging the empire. The fiercer they were, the more they could conquer without a fight. The destructiveness gave them a nasty reputation that was power, but it wasn't good for them in his history and history books. Baghdad was leveled, and the Islamic historiography on the Mongols is quite negative, very negative. Christian armies were defeated, 
and the European and Russian historiography on the Mongols is quite negative, ruthless, illiterate, vengeful, bloodthirsty, and on and on and on. Created nothing, just a bunch of horse riders from the steppe. The Mongols developed a nasty reputation, which was part of their success, but not good for posterity, for how posterity viewed them. However, it turns out that the Mongols did something very interesting. Once they imposed their rule over this vast space, merchants could travel through that space safely. Because if they were given a locket, which had the, signa, the insignia of the Khan, people would be afraid to rob them. If, they, if the locket said, this merchant travels under the protection of the Khan, you better be a pr pretty courageous person to rob all that merchant's goods. Because you might have to answer for it to somebody who was bigger than your band of scoundrels who was used to ripping off the caravan trade in Inner Asia. So Mongol rule imposed a kind of peace, a Pax Mongolica, which was very good for commercial ties. Not only did they have 6,000 miles in which to operate, but banditry was partially reduced. Because the merchants had to pay customs to Mongol rulers so the Mongols didn't want them paying that money to the bandits. That's called a state. A state is when the bandit takes the money and other bandits can't have it. <laughs> yes. I told you I teach world history. There's no need to apologize. Truth is a very powerful argument I've discovered. Another thing the Mongols did was they looked at skill also as a form of power. And if one group was good on astronomy, they brought them in. And if another was good at medicine, they brought them in. And so the Mongol court in China, known as the Yuan Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol court in China, in the 14th century was the whole world in one space. Byzantium, Persia, Marco Polo and other merchants from Venice, calendar makers, documents, calendars were produced at the Mongol Yuan court in every known language of the world. Tibetan, you name it. Moreover, the language of the Mongol court in China was Persian. For a hundred years, the Mongols ruled China with a Persian-speaking state in the center of it. Unfortunately, the Mongol capital was in the north, which is closer to the steppes. <coughs> the Chinese kept the capital in the north, Beijing, northern capital, which is this horrible, dusty, and now, unfortunately, smog-infested place, not like those graceful coastal cities of China. But nonetheless, despite the, let's say, inauspicious location of the Mongol court, it was the whole world in one place. All the knowledge that the Mongols could assemble from this 6,000 miles, they brought it together and they intermixed it. There was a cultural exchange on a scale that had never happened before. The same thing in Persia, Tibetans, Chinese, Russians, Uyghurs. They went to Persia under Mongol rule because they had skills, they had talents, they had special talents that Mongol rule valued. This was an imperial culture, not an ethnic culture. We make this mistake time and again. We talk about the Ottoman Empire. And we call it the Turkish Empire. That's nonsense. The Ottoman Empire had several dozen languages, including a court. 
We talk about the Russian Empire. Once again, it's not Russian in an ethnic sense. It's imperial. Nikolai Gogol, who was born Nikola Hoho in what is today Ukraine, wrote in the Russian language. Not because he was an ethnic Russian, he was an ethnic Ukrainian. But because Russian was the imperial language of this vast space which replaced the Mongols. In fact, the Mongols almost didn't use the Mongol language. Persian was the language of court, and Turkish was the language. Some Chagatai, Central Asian, Turkic dialects were the language of the vast majority of Mongol warriors. If you look at the Kazakh today in what's called Kazakhstan, Kazakh, Kazakhstan, they have the same features, physiognomy, as the Mongols. They're identical. One speaks a Turkic language, and one speaks Mongol. One is a Muslim people, one is a Buddhist people. But it's through this intermarriage process that I'm talking about that they ended up to be actually brothers and sisters. Now, the Mongols were not totally successful. They met defeat. What is today Egypt? Mamluk armies in Egypt defeated the Mongols. They couldn't cross the straits to get to Japan. They kept drowning in the sea because of the divine winds or kamikaze. The kamikaze, divine winds, kept drowning those land-based Mongol armies in the sea. And they never conquered the Japanese islands. They did, however, conquer Korea, the Korean Peninsula. In any case, the Mongols did not meet total success. There were limits to Mongol power. But the big story is the width and the breadth of this Mongol empire and how it's based upon conquest, but also lineage and kinship, the Chinggisid principle and the daughters. And then finally, recognition of skills, of artisanal skills and talent as a form of value to be exchanged and exploited. A non-ethnic and imperial culture. I'll take a few more minutes, if you don't mind. We're now at the point where whatever you had for dinner has been metabolized. <laughs> the sugar levels are utterly depleted. <laughs> if you're like me, you're completely exhausted at this point. Even if you don't have two small children, for whom I am too old or they are too young, I can't decide. <laughs> but we can't just leave you at the top of the Mongol story. We've got to carry you all the way through. I realize this is a little bit simplified. We're running through a lot of history in a short period of time. But you don't have time for 24 lectures. And you also probably don't have 50 grand lying around. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, it's gone because you have kids and grandkids <laughs> who are eating it up to hear these lectures uh, during the daytime. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I'm going to pay for it either. <laughs> Why didn't it last? Why is it gone? What happened to the Mongol Empire? Around 1200, you get those tribes banding together north of the Chinese Wall. Before 1300, they've got 6,000 miles. By 1500, it's gone, piece by piece. Well, part of the story is that others learn to adapt. The Mongols got tough, they got strong, and others learned to fight against them. Oh, you can take skills as a form of booty from all around and centralize it? We'll do that. Oh, you can use the tactics of fighting in the steps by retreating and vanishing and disappearing and coming back another day to fight? Okay. We'll try that too. 
also in addition to others getting smarter and stronger, the Mongols got a little bit weaker and fatter. You see, Mongol armies were good where there was grass, but it was a lot harder where there was stone and cities and not so much grass. They could rule the steppe, and in fact, their rule in Russia lasted more than 100 years longer than their rule in China and Persia. It was too bad, because all the money was in China and Persia, the wealth and riches, and Russia had almost nothing except for furs, which were good for the inside of those coats, because furs were up for the inside, not for the outside. <laughs> Nonetheless, once they moved out of the steppe, their big armies, they had a harder time keeping fit. Mongol warriors at full gallop could fire with their bow and arrow. They could fire an arrow 200 yards at full gallop and hit a target. Women could ride, children could ride, and they could all shoot the bow and arrow, which they started doing almost in the placenta. <laughs> but move from the steppes into those Persian mountains and plateaus and into those Chinese low-lying rice paddy monsoon civilization and also urban cities and the Mongols got weaker and fatter. Weaker and fatter. There were other reasons that the Mongols fell. When you connect Europe and Asia all the way through, that's great for commerce, but it can be bad at the same time. Like, for example, what if rodents are carrying a plague? And those rodents ride across the 6,000 miles with the Mongol armies, and they show up in Kaffa on the Crimean Peninsula, and then they get on a boat and they go to the Italian Peninsula where Marco Polo comes from. And a third of Europe dies from bubonic plague. The Mongols unintentionally spread the plague, the bubonic plague or the Black Death, which was not good for the Mongols either. The bubonic plague comes from southwestern China or the borderland between Han, speaking Chinese, and Inner Asia. We think of it as a European thing, the European Black Death, just like we think of Christianity as somehow a European thing, when of course it's the great Near Eastern religion that it is. The Holy Lands are not in Europe, even though that's where those popes live. <laughs> so things changed. There were negative as well as positive consequences of the Mongol Empire. Others got better. But in overthrowing the Mongols, they adapted many of Mongol practices. Sometimes the very terminology. Genga, Mongol customs, is the word in Russian for money. And I could give you term after term after term, which shows the huge impact of the Mongols on those peoples they conquered but did not hold, eventually lost the empire. Mongol rule was assimilated into the successor states in many ways. The Mongols spread Islam. A lot of Khans converted to Islam. The Mongols were critical for spreading Islam. The Mongols spread Turkification. They broke, not by design, but by consequence, the Arab hold on the Islamic world. The Osman or Ottoman Empire was a consequence in part of Mongol rule. The Delhi Sultanate, Mughal Empire also in India. Mughal is a 
mispronunciation of Mongol. So there are Mongol legacies built into this Eurasian sweep, even though they were overthrown. Something very interesting also happened at sea. The sea ceased to be a barrier and became a highway. The Portuguese, remember Columbus was just about the only one who didn't sail for the Portuguese. He sailed for the Castilian or Spanish court. They went around the coast of Africa. They picked up Arabic, Islamic, and other navigators, and they made it to India, people like Vasco da Gama. And the connections that the Mongols had established on land in the north were now established south of that across the oceans. First it was primarily the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and finally the British. This is sometimes known as the voyages of discovery, the discovery of the new world by the old world. It's where world history usually starts, wrongly, as you can now see, because the Mongol stuff made these connections on the land before the Portuguese, then the Dutch and the British made them at sea. The exchange across Eurasia produced the kind of rich consequences that form the rest of the lectures in this course. You will hear now, after I'm done in the coming weeks, about what happened after the Mongols. Afghanistan and Iran may seem unrelated, but they are deeply connected in this Persian-speaking Persephone Inner Asia sphere, which predated the Mongols and then which was folded into the Mongol Empire, which reinforced the levels of exchange. Exchange was unequal. Exchange is a kind of fancy word. Sometimes it wasn't exchange. Sometimes it was forcible. By exchange, we don't mean that two people voluntarily got together and one gave $24 in beads and the other gave the island of Manhattan. <laughs> That's not what we mean by exchange. Nothing fair like that. Nonetheless, the process of exchange by which we mean different cultures coming into contact and borrowing from each other, including the gene pool through this intermarriage, that level of exchange was highly unusual and it more or less produced those groupings that we are now going to label nations in the post-Mongol period, the post-imperial period. Just to take the story all the way, You'll forgive me for this run through, but once the British displace the Dutch, who have displaced the Portuguese, the British and the French fight more than a hundred year war for global supremacy from 1700 to about 1815. The British and the French are constantly at war for global supremacy. This is Geopolitics 101. And the British surprise everyone and win. The French have more people. They have the absolute estate. They have the Sun King, Louis XIV. They got it going. But once Napoleon is defeated, that's it. The British are supreme across the globe. The sun never sets on the British Empire. The British Navy rules the seas. Something like a third of the world is under the British flag at the height of the British Empire. The British do at sea what the Mongols have done on the land. It's the process that follows the Mongols mostly south, mostly coastal, mostly those monsoon civilizations because the British can't break through Afghanistan and they can't break through Iran, they can't break through the mountain ranges and the tribal cultures of the mountains, in part because it's hard to get through there and in part because the Russians are right there on the other side. But nonetheless, you can trace a Portuguese, Dutch, and most importantly, British story 
the defeat of Napoleon, British supremacy. They're not the only great power, but they are the greatest power. And then something funky happens. The person who had zits in school, <laughs> who was never one of the jocks, who couldn't get a date for the prom, all of a sudden becomes king of the mountain. And that's Prussia. Berlin and Prussia. There's an aggrandizement of Prussia, so-called unification of Germany, under Bismarck in the 1870s. And by the 1890s, the Germans are beating the British in the factories. German steel, German chemical industry, better than the British. And then in 1898, the Germans announce that they're going to build a navy. The British rule the seas. They will not countenance the existence of the rise of Germany on the continent, and especially the rise of Germany on the seas. And the British-German antagonism, deep. The British-German antagonism produces World War I. They divvy up the sides. But are you on the British side, or are you on the German side? in this British-German antagonism. The, the superpower and the rising power. The rising power had ambitions of its own, but the British could not find a way to accommodate the rise of Germany. The Russians stupidly chose the wrong side. World War II, we won't go into it, but you can see it as a consequence of this original World War I British-German antagonism that wasn't fully worked through. You also have the radicalization of the right, anti-Semitism, Hitler, a large part of that story. So here we are today. The British Empire is gone, like the Mongol Empire. The influences are vast. You can see the British influence across the world. Here we are today, in part of the British Empire, aren't we? It's a very big story, just like the Mongol story. And here we are today, and there is a global superpower, and another country has announced it's going to build a blue water navy. And they're building that navy because they're on the rise. And they need that navy because they sell and buy goods from across the world. And they import and export across the world. And they don't want to be boxed in by somebody else's navy. They don't want to be dictated to. And anyway, they're China. And they've been around a really long time before this other superpower even got started. So here we have world history, geopolitics 101. Here we have a situation not the same as, but not totally different from, the situation we had prior to World War I, a global superpower and a rising power that starts to build a navy. You know where the Chinese get their navy from? Russia. 95% of all Chinese weapons are purchased from Russia. 95%. That's why we have to expand NATO into Kosovo. Block those Chinese. Block those Russians. We're doing a great job with our foreign policy. It's amazing. <laughs> this, I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat. It's too painful to even contemplate. <laughs> Sadly. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Are we going to have the wisdom? to accommodate the rise of China as they build their navy. They're buying the submarines and the destroyers from the Russians. They're reverse engineering, like they always do in East Asia, so that they can build it without buying any more on their own. And now they're going to build aircraft carriers so they can project their power far away at sea. Sure, the United States has 1,600 military bases on foreign soil. Or C, 1,600 military bases. 
So it's not going to be easy for the Chinese. But nonetheless, you can be assured they're going to do everything they can to build that navy, whatever it takes. And when American ships go around Chinese waters, snooping and spying, the Chinese are going to bump them a little bit and give them the elbow, like they did with our ship, the Impeccable, a surveillance ship, not long ago in the South China Sea. We don't know what the intentions of the Chinese will be going forward. Aggressive, peaceful rise remains to be seen. I don't think the Chinese leadership itself knows. But just as important as Chinese intentions will be America's ability to find a way not to enter into bloody confrontation with the rising power. The responsibility lies on both sides. So in a way, we are still in this post-Mongol world. The Inner Asia story, I won't go into any more details because you're going to have many lectures on this Inner Asia story subsequently. You're going to do Pakistan, Afghanistan, all of that stuff. I just wanted to give you the sea story which follows the Mongols and provides a kind of full picture of this world history development and show you kind of where we are today and maybe a little bit to think about what would be the smart thing to do going forward. Thank you very much for your time. So we have some questions if people are not yet exhausted. Those who have to leave, no one will be insulted. I have to leave myself. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> yes. Further reading. Can you repeat the question? Yes, further reading on the Mongol Empire. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of primary sources in translation. We have Marco Polo's travel account, which is absolutely indispensable and a great read. Some of it is made up, <laughs> but then again, it's a book, isn't it? <laughs> and you guys have read a lot of books, and you know. Rashid al-Din, A-L-D-I-N, also an unbelievably great travel account, but through all the lands of Islam in the 13th century. He got his information from many Mongol sources. So we have the travel accounts, which are great. Rashid al-Din. He was born a Jew. He converted to Islam. He wrote one of the first world histories. There's probably an inexpensive paperback from Penguin Classics or something like that. Uh, we used to use it to teach it, but it was such a good book that it went out of print. <laughs> you know how that works? Yeah. I know how it works. There are many secondary books to read on the Mongols. What I suggest is I'll send an email to Nancy Beck at the adult school with a one-page reading list, and you guys can look it over and see if there's anything worth reading on that list. That'll be the easiest way, I think, instead of ticking it off these difficult names right now. I had a question over here, yeah. What was Marco Polo's interaction with the Mongols? Marco Polo saw the court of Kublai Khan, who was one of Chinggis Khan's four sons from his principal wife. The first wife was the principal wife, and the sons from the principal wife had the priority, no matter how many subsequent wives came along or concubines, because some of them didn't marry. And so Marco Polo saw the opulence, the power, and the intermixing, as I was describing it, of this Kublai Khan court. There's a great book on this by Morris Rosabi. I'll put that on the list, the Kublai Khan court. And so Marco Polo, like many Europeans, you know, was a little bit shocked. First of all, they had a lot of wealth. You know, not just a couple of jewels here and there, but they had these rubies and these sapphires. 
the size of people's heads. So he was a little bit bowled over. They had a communication system, relays of horses, that involved hundreds of thousands of messages traveling these 6,000 miles. These horses were parked at these relay stations. And a rider could ride all the way through the Mongol Empire, sometimes sleeping in the saddle, and bring a message, kind of like the internet, from one end to the other. <laughs> he saw a lot of stuff that was pretty unbelievable. That's the stuff in his book that's true, by the way. And that's the stuff that many of the Europeans didn't believe. But their appetites were wet. W-H-E-T. <laughs> and they wanted to figure out more of what riches were in that East. And that's why they took those boats. That's why they got on the sea in those little tiny decrepit European boats, which could barely make those waves, and went around something called Africa, which they knew nothing about, but turned out to be really long. <laughs> Vasco da Gama traveled a lot farther than Christopher Columbus did to get that statue on 59th Street. <laughs> you getting about that ready? I'm getting ready. I'm punchy. Yes, sir. And then your next one. Because more of the people who were technically expert, the skilled people, spoke Persian, and so did the merchant class. Because Persian was the inner Asian language of trade, commerce, and science. And they were the ones gathered at China. And also because the Mongols kept close watch on the number of Chinese speakers they were going to promote. In inner Asia, yes, it was. And it's true all the way until the 1930s. The Soviet Union destroys Persephone culture in Central Asia, and they allow Turkification. You get Uzbek, a form of Turkish, displaces Persian in Bukhara, Samarkand, and Tashkent. This is what is called, you'll forgive me for this, can we turn off the TV for a second? This is what's known as a trash canister. A trash canistan is not, this is my term, I'm on record with this one. It's not an ethnic term, it's a political term. It's when a hyper executive branch with a fake parliament and a fake judiciary owns a country, literally, and runs it for its own benefit. It's one of the principal forms of governance in the world. <laughs> yes. Yes. those East European Ponzi scheme regimes that I just wrote this other book about, Uncivil Society. I think we had, yes, ma'am. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Well, they lived on the milk, the mare's milk especially, which they drank. They fermented it, so it had a little bit of a kick. It was called kumis. And it was unbelievably nutritious. They mixed yeast and cultures in it, like what we today call yogurt or kefir. They made cheeses from it, which could last quite a long time. Because as you know, when that cheese gets green, you just get the knife. And there's cheese underneath it. <laughs> and if they ran out of water, because water is the whole story of Inner Asia, it's all about no water. If they ran out of water, the Mongols could just open up the vein on the animals and drink the blood. The Muslims and the Buddhists have a different relationship to blood in that regard. Uh, yes, sir. And then over there. Uh, we actually have quite a serious amount of documentation on the Mongols but we don't know how to read it because it's written in the form of genealogical stories of who's descended from whom. It's written with some uh, allegory 
And it's not written in the usual factual, dry, can't read it history book style that provides information. So it's very difficult to read. However, there are Mongolists, especially in Japan, which has by far the strongest tradition of Mongol studies. Oh, there is a mic. And uh, they know how to read these documents. The uh, Mongols are Lamaist Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism. So they have quite a rich tradition of writing. The documents are written in what's called Uyghur script. The Uyghurs, the same Uyghurs that had a big to do with the Han in Chinese Muslim territory. You know there are almost as many Muslims in Iraq as in China? Almost, not quite. But almost. Iraq is yes. So there are documents, but they're not easy to read because they're written in kind of what we would call a fairy tale style that hands down myths about people being born from the sun or being born from a tree. And it takes a lot of work to figure out what lies within those documents. In addition to the Japanese, the Germans also have a very strong tradition of Mongol studies. We at Princeton have one of the great Mongol libraries in the world. And we don't have a single Mongol scholar on the faculty. Because, and I won't say it, because <laughs> this guy's got a TV camera here making a DVD. And it's going to be on channel 30. And you know what? I'm not going to be safe anymore. <laughs> I think I had one over here. Yes, sir? That's a great question. Uh, it's a question about relations in Inner Asia and who's related to whom. Are the Uyghurs, for example, related to Onagor Tribal Association? The evidence is very hard on this. It's mostly linguistic evidence. And linguistic evidence is difficult to get proof with. In the 19th century, there were racial theories. The Indo-European race, for example. And they made these language trees of how this language begat that language. And then they invented languages that didn't yet exist, but thought they might find one day that were the precursor languages. That's the basis of modern linguistics today, for the most part. Unfortunately, it's a bunch of nonsense. Thought up by 19th century racists who made a lot of mistakes, didn't understand some of the languages they thought were related, imagined connections that were accidental and not organic, didn't take conquest into account in some cases. So untangling, disentangling tribal origins, tribal relations, and language trees is very, very thorny. Especially if someone is claiming a homeland and someone else is claiming that homeland too. Who was there first? Who came later? Who's not descended from whom? Who's a Semitic person and who's not a Semitic person? It's extremely complicated. There are really good people who work on this and try to disentangle it. But it's one of those you know, Mobius strips. And it's hard to find. Yes? Yes, the cosmology, very important topic. The shortest answer is that um, the Mongols did not have a state religion when they first started out. And they didn't, therefore, try to convert conquered peoples to their religion. They instead permitted the continued existence of whatever religious practices they encountered. And they had at the court all religions represented. There were Christian churches built in Asia by Mongol-led construction teams. And there were Christians at Kublai Khan's court in China. Nestorian Christianity, which has mostly disappeared from Inner Asia or East Asia. However, later on, when Mongols had some trouble because they didn't have a Khan, they didn't have a leader descended from Chinggis Khan on the male line through the centuries. They were illegitimate, and they were looking for legitimacy. 
and they sent an army into the Tibetan plateau and they picked one Lama and said, you are the highest Lama now, you are the Oceanic Lama, you are the Dalai Lama. The Mongols did this. Dalai is a Mongol word, not a Tibetan word. And in exchange, the one who was plucked out and raised above the others in Tibet, the Dalai or Oceanic Lama, said back to those who plucked him up, oh, you are not descended from Chinggis, but I will nonetheless recognize you as a Khan. I will legitimate your claim to the Khanship. So after the late 16th, early 17th centuries, the Mongols are associated with Lamaist or Tibetan Buddhism. There are Lamas at Kublai Khan's court. There are Lamas around Chinggis Khan. We seem to have some indication of Buddhist influences, but there is a deep association with Lama Tibetan Buddhism the late 16th, early 17th century. But as I said, many Mongol-led armies converted to Islam. It was the Mongols in Persia that created Islamic Persia. It was the Mongol ruler, the Il Khan, or the secondary Han, not the great Han, or the Chinggis Khan, who converted to Islam in Persia and made Islam the state religion in Persia. So the Mongol religious story is uh, many-sided, not a single religion. The, the important part of that story, though, is that we tend to put people in the box. Oh, you're blank or you're blank. But at the Mongol court, there was synergy, interconnection, borrowing, and study so that the religions could influence each other. And moreover, the animistic, sometimes called shamanistic beliefs, the beliefs rooted in nature, where gods are in the rivers and in the stones and in the sky, that survived all throughout the Mongol period and it survives in Inner Asia today, what we call shamanistic peoples. Maybe we'll take one more. One more I'm sorry, um, I, did I miss anybody or maybe we're done? Yes, ma'am. If they were pre-literate and their line from the royal line to them, you know, this is a type of descent, how do they know, how can they prove that that this is a person who came from this line? Yes. If it wasn't written down. It was written down. First it was chanted, it was sung. They sung the genealogies, that is to say they sung the descent. They chanted or sung the stories about where they came from. And then the scribes, of course, did write this down because the illiteracy of the Mongols was a slander by the Islamic peoples when the Mongols burned their city. But it was not a fact. The Mongols had the Uyghur script adopted from the Uyghurs and they had writing all throughout their empire. And as I said, the Mongol courts issued documents in every known language of the world, and a lot of those documents, including the ones we were discussing earlier, are genealogical stories. So-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so, and you get this right through to the modern period where people know their origins in tribal and other terms. Anyway, I'm sorry we're out of time. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your classes. <laughs>